I declare this meeting of the Port Phillip City Council open and I welcome everyone from the public who are here tonight. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the Yalakut Willem clan of the Bunwurong uh, and we pay our respects to their elders, both past and present, and we acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. So Council has a local law that determines how this meeting will be conducted. There's time allotted in tonight's agenda for public question time. During public question time, members of the public can ask specific questions on general matters other than those relating to a topic that's on the agenda tonight. There is also an opportunity for members of the public to ask a question or make a comment on a specific item in tonight's agenda. This will be done prior to Council considering the item. So when we have an item, First of all, we have um, contributions from the community and then we go on to questions of councillors and then on to the uh, resolution. We encourage questions or comments from the public um, that are directed through the Mayor, aren't defamatory, abusive or objectionable in language or substance, but rather are presented in a spirit of mutual respect of council and the community and we ask all speakers to abide by the directions of the chair. So if you wish to ask a question or speak to a report, please complete one of the blue forms just outside the chamber and hand it to a staff member. I encourage you to limit your questions and comments to around three minutes and to avoid repeating any points that have already been made. Please note that all council's uh, meetings are now being live streamed um, uh, please note that uh, this, in accordance with our local law, that uh, this cannot be filmed or audio taped unless permission is granted by the Mayor. And in the live streaming, your words will be recorded, the audio will be recorded, but your face and image will not be recorded, only that of councillors. And in the unlikely event of an emergency evacuation, please follow the instructions of the Chief Warden. And I never know who that person is. I suppose it's you? Aaron. Aaron, Aaron right. So apologies, councillors. We have no apologies because everyone's here. Minutes of the previous meeting. Councillors, the minutes of the ordinary me council meeting held on 6th of March have been circulated. Are there any questions in relation to these minutes? And it's been moved by Councillor Simic and seconded by Councillor Voss. Um, I'll now put the motion. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thanks very much. Now, declarations of a conflict of interest. Does anyone have a conflict of interest? Uh, Mayor, I'm Councillor Marcus Pearl. I declare in relation to 9.1 Children's Services uh, Policy Development. I have a, in a direct conflict of interest in this matter. Great. Thanks very much. We'll take that further when we come to that uh, report. Petitions and joint letters. Councillors, we have no petitions or joint letters tonight. Sealing schedule. Councillors, we have no, um, uh, no uh, sealing matters to be sealed. Councillors, in the light of the tragedy that has recently occurred in Christchurch, Council considers it's appropriate to observe a minute's silence. For this to occur, can I have a mover that we suspend standing orders? Moved Councillor Baxter, seconded Councillor Crawford. Um, I'll put the motion that standing orders be suspended. That motion is carried. I now ask all present who are uh, and able to stand and observe a minute's silence. Thanks very much. Um, 
Can I have a mover that we resume standing orders? Moved and seconded by uh, Councillor Baxter and Councillor Crawford. All those in favour? Carried. Um, condolence motion. Councillors, we have a proposed condolence motion for the City of Christchurch. Would somebody like to move this? Moved Councillor Crawford. Seconded Councillor Simich. Thanks. Um, Can I read it out? It, it would be good if you could read it out, Councillor mm -hmm. Crawford. So I'd like to move the motion that the City of Port Phillip utterly condemns the act of terrorism that occurred in Christchurch on Friday the 15th of March 2019 and extends its deepest sympathies and love to the City of Christchurch and all the members of the community, particularly the Muslim community, who were deeply impacted by this atrocity. We stand united with you in this time of deep sorrow and stand resolute in condemning such intolerance and hatred in our society. That the Council requests that the Mayor of the City of Port Phillip write to the Mayor of Christchurch to express these condolences and message of support. Thanks very much. Do you wish to speak to the uh, resolution? Councillor Simich? Is there any other councillor who wishes to speak for or against this motion? If not, I will now put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. Thanks very much, councillors. Public question time. Um, um, councillors, we have two uh, people who have requested to ask a question tonight, and I'll take these requests in the orders that they were received. Bill, Bill Garner. Bill, could I ask you to read your name into the record and your suburb, please? No. It's Bill Garner, St Kilda. Uh, I am the secretary of Bring Back Brooks Jetty. My two questions uh, will be asked at the end of this. As councillors will be aware from the recent updates circulated to them, there have been significant advances in our campaign. Among these is the acceptance by Parks Victoria that Brooks Jetty may be rebuilt and the delivery of a report offering fully developed design concepts by MP Rogers Associates. Based on thorough survey information, this report provides three variations for a jetty that can be built for between $1.1 and $1.6 million. We thank Council for its financial support in commissioning this report and hope that the Council, the City, will use the report, which I now formally present, to continue to support the case for a new jetty. And I would ask the Mayor to circulate the report to councillors. On an associated matter, councillors will be aware that Melbourne Water is now beginning to design the replacement for the concrete outlet of the Shakespeare Grove main drain at St Kilda Beach. The outlet is the stump of Brooks Jetty and Melbourne Water has indicated in writing that it is prepared to work with any entities which may propose a new jetty and to consult with the community about its new outlet design. Melbourne Water is open to considering suggestions from James Brearley, architect of the Pride Centre, on a way to make the outlet a more visually attractive presence on the beach and one that provides visitors with enhanced amenity by incorporating overhangs to provide shade. Images of James' wavy concept are included in the update we circulated. Replacing the present box structure will merely perpetuate the ugliness that has been exposed by the removal of the attractive little jetty. In light of its shared responsibility for the beach under the urban design framework, will Council at its forthcoming meeting with Melbourne Water, which we understand will be before the end of the month, push for a more imaginative design for the outlet. And there is one further consideration. As the existing outlet originally discharged into deeper water prior to the construction of the marina, will Council also suggest to Melbourne Water that for health reasons, the city would like the drain extended into deeper water in order to discharge the polluted water further from the beach. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks very much. Um, can I ask a question of you? Could, is it possible to send a soft copy of that, a soft copy of the your report to yes. me, so I can yes. send it round? Yes, I'll do that. Yep. And Mr. Jewell? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, um, in our preliminary meeting with Melbourne Water last month, uh, we did indicate that we were interested in seeing a more uh, creative solution to the design of the new outfall. Uh, that design hasn't taken place yet. Um, and uh, that was uh, the next meeting with Melbourne Water uh, has not been um, timetabled yet, but it is potentially within the next couple of weeks where we can continue to talk with them about that issue. Uh, Melbourne Water have indicated that they're also keen as part of their engagement to talk to the community about the outfall and, and how it looks. Um, the, the second question, uh, the one about uh, the, the outfall and its extension into deeper water is something we'll have to take on notice. Thanks very much. Sorry, we'll get back to you on that second question. Thank Thanks you. very much. Um, Mr Bill Phelan. Former South Melbourne councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a, it's a long time for <laughs> <laughs> uh, Press that middle button. Oh, right, it's showing green. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. What uh, my my question uh, relates to uh, contractual uh, um, details with uh, probably a major contractor in, in Fulton Hogan. I'd like to know for the 2017-2018 uh, uh, year what the contract figure was. For that same year, how much of additional works was allotted to Fulton Hogan? So the, the, the figure that, that we paid them for, for works outside their contract. If, if uh, I think that that figure needs to be known, and the other question is, for additional works, at what stage do we get three competitive quotes? How much of our additional works is just being uh, negotiated with Fulton Hogan on a on a one-off basis? Because there's a huge huge amounts of work, and uh, and I understand that uh, that's where their profits come from. And I think these questions are more than relevant. Thanks very much, Mr Phelan. Um, can I... Through you, Mr Mayor, I'll need to take those questions on notice. So is it OK if we take that on notice and we'll Absolutely. get back to you? I did not expect, Mr Mayor, that that would be uh, on tap. Right. Thanks right. very much, Bill. Okay. Good to see Thank you. you. Um, councillor question time. Councillors, are there any questions of the officers? Oh, sorry. <laughs> councillor Pearl. Thanks. Councillor Gross. My question relates to a budget submission that was made by some South Melbourne locals uh, last year regarding Sol Green and the refurbishment of Sol Green. They put a budget response in uh, and didn't hear anything back. I'm just wondering, do we have a formal process in place whereby uh, if community groups go to, in some cases, a large amount of trouble to put a, a, a well-worded, well-researched submission into a budget process, what happens in terms of communication back to them based on the result of their budget process? Um, and that's the first question. The second question is, uh, what plans does Council have uh, for refurbishing the Salt Green Reserve? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, I can answer the first question and perhaps one of my colleagues can answer the second. Uh, with respect to the uh, Council plan submission process, our officers uh, always uh, provide feedback back to those uh, community members that have often taken considerable time and effort in making their submission. Um, it, it disturbs me that the... Um, uh, community members haven't received a response and I'll follow that up personally to see see what happened, what has happened in, on this occasion, but we do have a standard process in that regard um, to thank uh, people about their contribution but also let them know what the outcome was. Thanks very much. 
Can anyone answer the second question? Councillor Voss. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to ask uh, the question about the trees being planted. Um, we're expecting sorry, over... Um, sorry to interrupt. Oh. We, di we didn't have a, an answer to that second question. I think we'll take it on notice. Yeah, I think, I think we... Sorry to interrupt you, Councillor Boss. Um, I think we have to take that out on notice. Oh, we'll... Yes, Mr Mayor, we'll take the second part of Councillor Pearl's question on notice. Thanks. Councillor Boss? Apologies. Um, so this season coming about now, we're about to plant another 1,000 trees in, within our municipality. We've got a contract with, um, with a company uh, that each tree... Um, is maintained for two years. Um, I'm just wondering if you could detail how often the trees are actually watered under that two-year contract and what mechanisms are in, are in place to ensure that, uh, that that is done, that that watering is actually carried out. Mr Trail. Through you, Mr Mayor, um, it is correct uh, that uh, we do have a two-year maintenance period after installation of new trees. I'll need to take on notice the exact watering cycle of that. In regards to auditing, we have monthly auditing of our parks contracts, which includes the park maintenance and tree levels, and that is incorporated as part of that uh, each month as part of our standard review process. Um, Councillor Crawford? I'm going to ask a follow-up question, if I may, on that one, because I'm now now interested. So after that two-year period is complete, do we just depend on rain or do we have any kind of program in place after that or do we encourage people to adopt a tree? What, what exactly happens? Through you, Mr Mayor. Um, the majority of our tree stock relies on natural rain uh, after that two year period. Uh, we do have some garden areas and vegetation that we do provide watering to, but the majority of our tree stock is uh, self sufficient after that two year period. Council Boss? I just wanted to ask about the new pool fencing um, legislation and council's obligations and wondered um, if we're yet in a position that we can, uh, or what are we doing you know, to carry out our pool fencing obligations under the new regulations? Through you, Mr Mayor, we'll have to take that question on notice. Thank you. Thanks, Mr Dumas. And Councillor Voss? Uh, probably another hard one. Um, apologies. Could, could have given some notice on it. Um, but the soil contamination um, new legislation as well around Council's obligations. Um, uh, just wondering um, if we're aware of those and what we're doing to make sure our community is safe. Any more questions? Okay. Um, let's move now on to reports. Um, council, the first item is 9.1, Children's Services Policy Development. Councillors, we've received two requests from members of the public to speak on this item. I'll now call on Suzanne Provis. Just while she walks to the uh, microphone, uh, Mayor, I, Councillor Marcus Pell, declare that in relation to item 9.1, I have a direct conflict of interest and I'll remove myself as a result. Hi. Could I ask you to read your name and uh, suburb into the record, please, Suzanne? Suzanne Provis, St Kilda. Thanks. I'm a long-term resident and citizen of Port Phillip, proud of our many achievements and innovative policies and practices, including our 2006 childcare policy. And I thank the councillors who were on council then. 
My working life has been in a variety of education, child and family services related roles, so that's the expertise that I bring to this particular policy question at Council. I think that the, I thank Council for the iterative and mostly inclusive policy development process, and I say mostly because I have not seen evidence in that report of the voices of our municipalities vulnerable and marginalised residents informing the policy issues and options. The section starting on page eight of Every Child Our Future, section why do we need a children's services policy, provides a very succinct evidence-based rationale that begins. Access to quality education lies at the heart of healthy human development. Continuing access to meaningful learning and development experiences is also critical to long-term improvements in productivity, the reduction of intergenerational cycles of poverty, preventable health care, the empowerment of women and reductions in inequality. Enabling participation and inclusion to services for children requires supporting universal access to services that are affordable, safe and high quality. That rationale is not clearly and or consistently evident in the policy recommendations in my view. And I'll use the national competition policy to illustrate this point. I found that the NCP was poorly explained in the document, but it pervades the policy recommendations both explicitly and implicitly. There's scant attention paid to the universal benefit supporting universal access to services that are affordable, safe and high quality. So the social benefits, not just the economic benefits, um, have always been very important to the citizens of Port Phillip and to um, Port Phillip councillors. Uh, the, to illustrate that point further, policy objective three is about financially sustainable and alignment with relevant local, state and federal policies and legislation. The NCP is the basis for all five of the future service mo models listed in policy recommendation 3.1 and the underlying reason for policy recommendation 3.2. There are many other relevant policies and legislations, such as the Early Childhood Reform Plan, which could lead to a policy recommendation to increase kindergarten participation. Thank you. Thanks. Just in time. <laughs> well done. Um, thanks very much, Ms Provis. Um, Brenda Forbath. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Brenda Forbath, Community Alliance of Port Phillip, and I live in Elwood. There's much to be commended in the very expensive, extensive um, documents relating to a range of important children's services that, that have been tabled here tonight, such as the importance of greater coordination and collaboration between services, staff professional development, improvements in the centralised waiting list, the need for forward planning, access and equity issues, equity issues and much more. However, Community Alliance of Port Phillip is concerned about the focus um, on uh, councils with withdrawal from direct service provision as a policy option for the future and another focus um, is on full cost recovery as a model for, future, uh, for the future. And they're outlined in attachment one, uh, the policy issues and options paper at pages 44 to 45, and I urge councillors to have a very close look at that. It is claimed that future policy in this area must meet national competition policy requirements and that council run services and or council subsidies to its own services and other community based and not for profit services may be in breach of the national competition policy. Now councillors we've had this debate in the past a couple of times during the Kennett state government era 
and subsequently in this council, um, which Councillor Gross will remember when he was last on council, I'm going back quite a decade or more. Um, in the end, um, council decided to continue to operate and develop its own services and to support and subsidise the community not-for-profit sector. They decided to do this um, as it was in the public interest. There was no legal challenge to that decision at that time. The national competition policy, um, as, as you would know, uh, was introduced in Australia in the 1990s. The principal objective of national competition uh, policy is to promote competition within the economy where it is considered to be in the, in the public benefit. And I stress that. If Council intends to go down the path of policy recommendation 3.1, B, C, D or E, and again I refer you to pages 44 to 45 of that very large report that's in your um, package of documents, there needs to be a very open and detailed consultation with the community about this very substantial change. And I say this um, in the context of the recommendations from Council's own Children's Services Reference Group. That's at attachment three in your documents, appendix two, in which a key priority was that there should be a continuation of the current policy of providing a mix of services, council run, community managed and private, and that Council should continue to offer financial support for community run services. The recommendations say that a mix of services ensures that families have choice and that they can access more affordable childcare. These particular views from the Children's Services Reference Group do not appear to have made it into the executive summary and recommendations, unfortunately. CAP will have much more to say on this important policy at a later stage, but tonight, councillors, we recommend that you heed what the community is saying to you about council's role in the delivery and financial support of children's services. We also say that council needs to challenge the argument that national competition policy forces it to cease delivery and funding of children's services. And this raises the question, to what extent have councillors been briefed on national competition policy and its impact on local council services for children and families? In the end, public benefit must be the core to any future decision. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ms Forbar. Ms Forbar? Okay. We've got... Councillors, we've got... Yeah. Can I ask, uh, councillors, do you have any questions of officers? Councillor Voss. Thank you. Um, just wanted to reference uh, the Murdoch report um, first up. It makes numerous recommendations to be included in the policy going forward. Um, I saw some of them reflected in the policy recommendations, but some were missing. I'm just wondering, how was the decision made not to put some in? Why is there a gap? Who am I speaking to? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, um, and just before I respond to your question, Councillor Voss, I just need to, as per the Local Government Act, declare that I have an indirect conflict of interest because of close association with this topic. Um, in relation to the recommendations in the Murdoch report, they made 15 recommendations. Um, the recommendations that we've provided um, represents the synthesis of those recommendations. Certainly the intention was to incorporate the majority of those recommendations. Um, there were a couple of recommendations made by the Murdoch report um, concerning uh, very, very early um, childhood, so maternal child health and even talking about pregnancy, which we didn't include in our recommendations because they're out of the scope of this report, but certainly we are taking that board on board in the future planning for family, youth and children services. Councillor Simich. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to take on Ms Forbath's question about the um, national competition policy and to what extent uh, councillors have been briefed. Uh, through 
through you, Mr Mayor, and I might also throw over to Ms Parsons as well. Um, the, uh, in briefings, we've explained obligations under the national competition policy uh, with this area and other areas. It's an active issue that Shreya, the risk assessment committee, I can't remember the full no, full okay. of the acronym Figure is that. looking at because there's a range of areas where we may not be compliant. Uh, in summary, there are a number of obligations under national competition policy um, that council have to undertake. The first is they have to assess whether a council activity is deemed a significant business unit. Uh, that's the first step. That has been done and the childcare centres are deemed a significant business unit. Um, it's fairly easy to ascertain that our activity is much greater than some other councils that have got themselves into trouble with NCP for running a uh, lower number of childcare services. But then the next steps in national competition policy is you have to then demonstrate reasons as to why a subsidy can be applied, and that will be part of this. So if you can demonstrate a public interest for applying the subsidy, you are still compliant. If you can demonstrate that it would be unduly costly to comply with NCP, uh, you don't have to act. Again, you'd still be compliant. Um, and Ms Parsons, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, I think only, I mean, Ms Forbath's representation was quite accurate. It is an option available to us um, to continue to subsidise um, as long as we can demonstrate that it is in the public interest. Um, it's very, the context that childcare is operating in now is very different to the context it was operating in when council was last having this conversation. And there's more controls in place to ensure quality provision, making that, making a defensible argument of public interest and how we're using um, our funds. Um, needs to be considered very carefully um, so that we can defend that the continuing as is, is in the public interest. Uh, Mr CEO wants to... Now more. Through you Mr Mayor, just to add, uh, the audit, Council's Audit Committee has also been briefed on this issue and also to clarify, uh, Mr Keenan, correct me if I'm wrong, NCP only applies to directly provided council services, not community childcare services that council fund. Is that correct? Through you Mayor, yes, council is quite at liberty to fund not-for-profits, community managed uh, and being, it's only the council operated services that are uh, in scope. Um, oh, uh, Councillor Brand? Uh, I was going to ask a, uh, a question about um, uh, council childcare services, which has partly been answered by some of the comments which have already come. But I'm still, uh, I'm keen to find out traditionally um, Council services have been regarded as sort of superior to commercial services, and there are, there are several reasons f for that. I'm just wondering whether you would outline what has been the basis of that sort of reputation of, of um, council services, no doubt in part due to the subsidies that it puts in, but for other reasons too. And, uh, and, and I suppose just explain to me why in the... Um, in the uh, Policy Recommendation 3.1, Option A. None of the benefits of it are actually listed in that option. Only the only the um, disbenefits of uh, going down that route. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
in regards to the reputation of um, council in childcare, um, I guess it's uh, difficult to comment on reputational, but I, what I would say is that local government uh, was a, a leader and one of the first government bodies to, to recognise the importance of providing childcare and supporting families. And we've got a long history of being in that space, um, which contributes to a, a high reputation. Um, there's also um, been some issues in the past with some market failure um, in terms of the private market for childcare, which has con potentially contributed to some mistrust. Um, but again, the context that we're operating in now um, with the federal and state government policies um, providing support um, for childcare and putting in place frameworks um, such as the National Quality Framework, which provides an objective assessment of all childcare centres. Um, provides a greater level of objective assurance about the quality of all services, not just council services. Um, and the second question that you were asking, just remind me. Oh, why didn't we put in the benefits? Um, I, I, I take on the feedback that that's how... that that one has read and we can look at how we're communicating that um, going um, going forward in the consultation. Councillor Voss and then uh, Councillor Baxter. Thank you. I'd like to take up the question from Ms Provis. Um, she wasn't able to evidence any vulnerable marginalised voices in the, in the documentation. Um, just wondering if that's the case, um, what are we going to do to rectify that issue? Um, through you, Mayor, um, I, I would propose that there are quite a few recommendations within the paper that do explicitly do that. Uh, the major one is that um, we create a subsidy that specifically enables um, vulnerable families to access early childhood services across the city, regardless of whether they're council run, not for profit, community managed or private. Um, so that would be a vast improvement to current policy settings. At the moment, there is no, there is a small subsidy which hasn't really been taken up. I think there have been two families, if I'm correct, uh, the early education grants that were put in place in relation to changes by the Commonwealth. The second uh, policy recommendation, which is very important, I think, it recognises that uh, financial hardship is not the only barrier for some vulnerable families, that particularly those families that might be experiencing family violence, might be homeless, uh, might have mental health or alcohol and drug issues. There's a specific recommendation to fund an outreach capacity to work with those services to ensure that those children are accessing the appropriate service for them. Again, that is sector neutral. It may be, for example, I know there is a high degree of poverty in some aspects of the Jewish community. Uh, it's quite likely we think that those children are accessing their services through uh, faith-based services. Mm -hmm. So we would want to be able to work to enable them to get into service. So. We would, I would argue that there's some substantial improved recommendations. I guess the final thing is that the subsidy to council-run services, over 50% of the families using council-run services have incomes above $180,000, uh, and 20 of the families have incomes of above $480,000. So I don't think there's any targeting currently towards vulnerable families, either on the basis of income 
or complexity? Um, Mr Keenan, um, if I may, when I hear the word evidence of voices, I, um, while you've answered sort of from the policy recommendations, I'm probably wondering about the input. Have they been consulted with to come up with those policy recommendations? And probably that's the other side of that question. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, we have undertaken some research um, with um, service providers to understand some of the challenges and barriers that vulnerable people are experiencing. Um, the recommendations also reflect um, the conversations that our family support um, team have had and continue to have um, with those um, groups within the community. So whilst they might not be specifically um, in the report, it certainly has informed where we've got to with the recommendations. And through you, Mr Mayor, there's also been a reference group that's met and there have been some specific consultations looking at the issue of vulnerability. Uh, we've also commissioned some research which we've just received uh, looking at the number of families on healthcare cards at services. Again, it's difficult to do it. We can easily get that data from our own <laughs> council run services and we've got information from most of the community managing we're still trying to get it from other not-for-profits and from private. Councillor Baxter? Uh, yes, uh, my question was about, um, so uh, the report that we looked at uh, and in the briefings we received, um, there was, there's obviously been quite a lot of work done on how council um, provided childcare stacks up economically against um, various you know, private and um, community run uh, but uh, and, the, and the question I had at the time which was um, kind of uh, taken on notice and I'm not sure whether you, uh, whether you've got it yet is um, were were was a similar sort of look done about um, quality about whether the council run uh, centers have had an impact on quality across the municipality in that raised it or, or, or something like that. Um, obviously, the, yeah, the, the economics stuff being separate to that. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, being the research to understand our influence on quality is um, difficult um, at the moment because we've only really got reliable data on quality for a short number of time um, and we've been in that market um, that whole time so it's um, difficult to uh, separate and make any kind of statements about cause and effect of our role in that market um, but we uh, just because it's a difficult uh, question um, doesn't mean we're not still kind of looking at what are the things that we can do because um, obviously if we were to pull out of the market one of the things that we need to be very confident is that we're not going to have a negative impact on quality. Uh, through, um, through you Mr Mayor what we can objectively report is assessment against the national quality standards uh, and that shows that all of the council operated services are exceeding or meeting standards. All bar two of the community managed are exceeding or meeting and one is excellent which is one of the few in the state. Uh, the private and other not-for-profits, there are more of those not meeting the standards in comparison. But again, there are a number who are meeting or ex exceeding. I guess the other role council has played in improving quality has been the quality subsidies to the community managed centres uh, and also 
um, assistance with professional development, networking amongst those services, which I think has all contributed to improving quality across the sector. Just Mr. Kennan, can I? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, one further point of clarification. At the moment, the way we provide subsidies to community run centres, um, they're expressed as a quality subsidy, but they're not specifically tied to quality outcomes. So there is an opportunity to improve, you know, that relationship between our subsidies and outcomes through the policy. Thanks. That's good, useful. Mr. Keenan, can I ask you a question? Could you, I ask you to quickly tell us a cautionary tale of um, on Hobson's Bay, I believe it was, who didn't comply with the competitive uh, rules? So what triggered that was a complaint from a private provider and then they was then forced to uh, undergo the assessment and there was an external agency and anyway it found that they were not compliant, found that it was a significant business unit and that there was no public value served through the subsidy and from memory I think they are given 28 days to exit service. So they had to sell their business? Uh, and a financial penalty, yes. Yeah. And was that a court decision, was it? No, it was a decision of the regulator. Councillor Voss? Thank you. I'd just like to ask a question um, about policy recommendation 2.4. Um, I'm ha having a bit of trouble understanding exactly what it means. Um, in that what does consider transitioning current council assets into kindergarten facilities to meet future demand mean? Does it mean more assets for kinder? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, what that means is because of state government announcements around funding for kindergarten and then there's various promises by federal parties that there will be more funding available for three-year-old kindergarten, it's economically much more, it's much cheaper for families to access kindergarten. So we think that the demand will change significantly. That just simply means where we run long day care at the moment, changing that to kindergarten space because of demand by parents. So in places where we run significant amount of early childhood education services or long day care, that are changing those to three-year-old kindergarten. So, councillors, I'm keen to make a decision on this. Remember, this is... Thank Councilor you. I have Voss. a few more questions, Mayor. It's a very important document. Um, I uh, want to understand about the waiting list and um, in terms of it... it so, uh, in particular, 5.6. Is the cost of the improvement to the current childcare wait list, is it, it's funded in, it says it's going to be part of the customer experience budget. Is that f currently funded or will it be out of that current funding that we've, that's been approved? In relation, oh, sorry, through you Mr Mayor, in relation to the customer experience, no it's not currently funded. Um, we will be, the, the customer experience needs to get the basic architecture rolled out and then this would be something we might be able to transition to that down the track, but no, it's not currently funded. In relation to the wait list, I think Ms Nelson might have... <laughs> Through you, Mr Mayor. Um, we've received $25,000 from the state government to investigate a central enrolment project for four-year-old kinder. Uh, and that will be applicable to three-year-old kinder as the three-year-old kinder program is rolled out across the state. So currently we're using those funds to scope out what we would actually need to develop a central enrolment policy, scope what type of platform we could use, a communication strategy and a consultation strategy. This municipality by 2022 will expect all its three-year-olds to access at least five hours of kinder and by 2029, 15 hours of kinder. 
So just to follow up to that, that's you're talking about 5.3 there, which is talks about a municipal-wide enrolment system. Is that different to the um, central child care waiting list, or are you looking at combining them into one? Sorry, we're not looking to combine them into one at the moment. They're two separate projects. So one's currently for long day care and this particular project is for the kindergarten central enrolment. Councillor Crawford. I guess I was just going to ask, if I may, um, Mr Mayor, with the national quality standard, is that the right term um, used, how often is that assessed? Is it a, an annual uh, assessment? And if, uh, say, we're saying some of the private providers are not meeting it, how long do they have to rectify those standards? Is there... Uh, what's, I can't, just a bit more understanding about the process, please. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, uh, we believe that um, centres are assessed every three years, uh, so it's not an annual assessment. Um, I'd have to take the question regarding... Oh, we might just give us one. So I've just been advised um, that it, the frequency of the assessment depends on your assessment. Um, so if you get a uh, meeting or exceeding, um, then you'll be assessed every three years. Um, if you're as assessed as below that, you'll be assessed <coughs> annually, one to two years, um, which I would assume is designed to keep and the, the incentive to change. Mr Keener? Through you, Mr Mayor, probably part of the consultation of what we might bring back is whether a centre operating out of council-run premises or in receipt of council grants doesn't meet the standards over a period, whether we would want to look at that uh, and whether that service continued or whether we wanted to transition to another provider. But that will be part of the consultations. Councillor Voss, you're right. Um, okay, councillors, we've asked our questions. Do we have a resolution? There is an alt rec, which uh, has an amended, an additional 3.4, allowing the standard um, CEO alteration. Okay, is that, are we all done? Are we all dusted? I'll, I'll move the uh, alternative recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Seconded Councillor Boss. Okay. Well, this is the first time since 2006 that we have had an extensive examination of this core part of Council's human services, this much loved, much appreciated, much used part of human services. Um, in the past, of course, I was a user of a council-run childcare centre in Elwood. I just wanted to go over some of the um, attributes of the report that stuck out to me. I just want to say two preliminary things. First of all, tonight really is not about the substance of the report, although you can't ignore the substance because that's so important. But um, it does involve an endorsement to some extent, but it also notes that um, this has to be returned to Council after some more consideration and community engagement. So tonight really is about throwing it out there. Uh, secondly, I would have to say that this was a report of some excellence 
and I'm really proud of the officers and the work they've done, so thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to say uh, a couple of things now about the substance of the report. In 2.2.6 of, um, of the officer's report, attached, which attaches this um, policy document, it talks about the changes since 2006, which are so important. The first is that we're a growing city. Uh, there's going to be a massive in increase in the number of kids that we have to look after. There's been significant policy and legislative changes. Um, the, uh, there's the National Child Care Subsidy. There's the National Quality Framework that we've talked about tonight and national competition policy. So since 2006, there's been significant policy and legislative change. And we, you know, after 12 years, we have to revisit it. It's a changing market. Private and independent services have increased their percentage in the market over since 2006, and there is some evidence, albeit often contested, that the standard has now changed, principally because of the national quality framework. And finally, there's financial and asset sus sustainability. 59% of our buildings are over 50 years old. Old. 41% of the buildings were purpose built for child services. That leaves almost 60% that weren't. And that is a grim reality for us in the consideration of our policy. So, more kids, big changes, a different market structure, and assets that are in trouble. So, that's an important part. On page three of the document, we talked about listening to the community. And I, I've been part of that listening process and I believe that we have listened to the community and the community has a number of different voices. The thing that's really important for me is on page nine. Page nine talks about our, page nine of the report. Page nine speaks to my heart on this issue, which is that we have a duty to the most vulnerable. If we're going to spend money, it has to be targeted. If we're going to spend money, we have to reach in, uh, into the, our vulnerable families and support them at a critical time of life. It's, that's the really important part of my approach to this issue. Um, I now want to talk about uh, there was this really interesting um, thing, I think it was on about page uh, 18, where we talked about what does council do? I've sort of never seen this in all my endless years on this council. I've never seen officers try to quantify, do we have a statutory duty? Do we have a, um, uh, an administrative duty? Do we have... A, a choice, a policy choice that we're making. Do we have, uh, why are we doing something? And this was a really interesting conversation because it said, okay, we've got absolutely no statutory duty to do this. We want to do it, we're going to do it. But it was a really interesting conversation because, and I think we need to do it more because in life-saving clubs and housing and all through our human services area, there's no statutory du duty to do stuff. We do it because we choose to do it. I think it's important that we have this open conversation and make explicit the choices that we wish to make. Just fire up my computer. But um, I want to go to page 20 of the report. Page 20 of the report starts the conversation about the financials. And what it says, sorry, I've just got to, my computer's gone to sleep and it needs to be woken up from bye-byes. Um, what it says is that over the last 10 years, we've spent $22 million on this 
area. And in the last year, we spent about $2 million on um, council-run childcare and, oh, <laughs> this magical CEO, and uh, $2 million on, child, on, on our provided childcare and $1 million on um, uh, community-managed centres and for private, it's been zero, and for independent, not-for-profit, zero. Now, that sort of, not discrimination, but differentiation is something... I might need it again, sorry. <laughs> that is, is now something that, firstly, is now no longer acceptable on called, along policy guidelines and may not even be lawful. But I also don't know that it's actually good policy. Um, and the, the, the most damning um, piece of information that we heard from the officers was that uh, some of our subsidy is going to people who earn about half a million dollars a year as a, um, an income. And the average is families on $180,000 a year. Where's the targeting of the vulnerable? Where is the taking of our ratepayers' dollars and putting them to the best use possible, which is supporting vulnerable people? And how do we justify giving, shelling out money to, you know, I'm thinking of two childcare centres on the same road, op virtually opposite each other. One gets a lot of money because it's not in a purpose-built home and the other gets zero. So I, I, I think that that's a really important page that we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing? Um, the final, point, uh, final few points I wanted to make is um, we're relatively wealthy as a community but we have real pockets of deprivation. 20% of our um, people using these services are classified as low income. Uh, working families in Elwood are about 66% and sole parents in the work, in, there's also sole parents in the workforce. So we've got a, um, we've got a mixed clientele and there's no evidence that our, uh, our subsidies are going to where they need to go. I feel absolutely passionate about this and I feel desperately upset in one sense that we haven't been um, focusing our expenditure hitherto and excited by the opportunity to do that because all of the studies show that the most cost-effective thing to do to keep people out of jail or out of uh, um, poor outcomes is to support vulnerable families in the under twos. This is our duty. This has to be our mission. So um, I'll leave it there, but I want to just finish up on one controversial one, which is our facilities. Page 50 um, looks at our centres. It's a bit opaque about how expensive it would be to remediate some centres. These are in my patch. These are people who will really object if we do not give significant subsidies to support them. This has been referred to a um, centre-by-centre analysis and we have to be wary of throwing a bucket load of money at not purpose-built um, centres that can never be um, best practice and can never be easily viable because they're too small. So thank you very much to the officers. It's been a provocative report. It's a great report and councillors, this is just the start of what's going to be a very contested journey but I think it's really important uh, that we conduct this journey with uh, intellect, 
courage and vigour in order to make sure that we do the best thing possible by our community and target our funds at low-income families and protect our services from accusations that we're not competitively neutral. Thanks. Councillor Voss. Thanks, Mayor. Um, you have mentioned quite a lot of things and um, I'll try not to repeat any of them. But I wanted to say that this is the single reason why I got onto council and why it interested me. Um, from my experiences that I had when my kids were at childcare. So I was really pleased to see that this document does really explore what council's role is in early childhood services and it, for now and in going into the future. And when you look at it and look at the landscape, there's been you know, 19 federal and state legislative changes. We've doubled our, our population of zero to fours um, since our last policy. And I have to say that part of the reason for the last policy was to actually increase the number of childcare um, places and, and facilities out there in the city of Port Phillip. Um, in particular private independent childcare. And I have to say that it's largely been successful if you want to look at it like that because that 2006 policy, we look at it now and there's a, a vast amount more out there. And in fact, um, some of our childcare centres are not even filling, filling their, um, their rooms up at the moment. Ageing assets, as you've, as you've mentioned, they no longer meet regulation and the cost of upgrading them. Well, we have to consider, is this a really good use of our ratepayers' money? What is our stewardship of the, these assets? And then, most importantly, we need to consider our children, the children of our municipality, and that's the single reason why we're looking at all of this. Um, so it's articulating the vision for the future for our services in, in City of Port Phillip. I wanted to uh, call out two areas that, are, that haven't been included, and that's the playgroups and um, our toy libraries into the policy. I think that's really important and it's good that we're bringing it in. I think we need to do a bit of work on, on the document around that. Um, but we do need to bring what we're doing in, that, in the City of Port Phillip into line with contemporary practice. The Murdoch... Um, document, the research piece in there was fantastic. I um, very saddened many, time, many, many ways to read that document, but um, in being asked, what is the single most important thing, the single piece of thing that we can do as a city to inform our policy? What is the best thing we can do? And, you know, what is it that will maximise the opportunity of our children in the first 1,000 days? And, um, you know, to actually go through through that and see what that is, um, and that that period of time, that first 1,000 days, has um, that period has lifelong consequences. I think was incredible, incredibly important to um, make sure that we focus as a municipality on our uh, zero to to four. The thousand days actually also includes pregnancy, but as was pointed out, that's not what this document's looking at, but it's very, very important. So if anyone hasn't read this document, at least read that. It's very informative. Um, and also being asked to review the evidence as to the efficacy um, of the integrated hub model versus the standalone services. I think that's incredibly important. Um, we've been going down the hub model, and it's really important to say, <laughs> is it right? Um, so... I wanted to thank everyone that's actually come out and participated in the in the program over the last 12 months. I suppose it's been or even longer, and input into the that's come out popped out in these policy recommendations. Perhaps we haven't got them all right, you know. And this is the opportunity, um, you know, to tailor them a bit further, hone them in, or we might have got them right. Um, it's really up to the community to um, let us know how that goes. So. Just a final note, we always need to consider the children and this is where we need to balance those levers that we have to pull um, to make this work for everyone. So um, I'll be endorsing the motion to go out to consultation. Thanks, Councillor Voss. That was a ripper. Thanks. Councillor Baxter. And uh, you didn't repeat anything I'd said. Nothing. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Look, I, I also just wanted to thank uh, everyone that's been involved in the process so far and to um, really encourage people to get involved 
uh, as we consult further. Um, as, as a father with two little ones, this, uh, this stuff is really important to me personally, um, but also as a counsellor and because of our history uh, in this area. Um, I know that uh, it, it, there does seem to be some fears uh, in terms of people that have contacted me that a council is heading down some predetermined course that, um, that, you know, that we're not uh, going to budge from. Um, and I just want to reassure people that that's certainly not how I feel about it. And I really look forward to seeing uh, people's input uh, from the community going forward. Thanks, Councillor Baxter. Okay. Oh, can, uh, a late, a late hand, Councillor Brand. Yes, I'll certainly be uh, voting f uh, for this um, uh, motion. Um, uh, <clears throat> very obviously, because this is actually uh, uh, a motion to put this document out there for public consultation, um, and I think it's a document that we can very largely be very proud of, and it's. Uh, uh, you know, I, I really, I, I really enjoyed reading it, and I feel it's sort of comprehensive and a pretty good document to go out there. And I know that the work and the thinking that's gone into it has been extensive and fantastic. But just for my own purposes, and I think for um, parts of the community, I just do want to sort of comment on some of the things that were questions that were answered before my. My personal understanding of childcare is, well, I haven't got children, so I haven't had the uh, privilege of having to find childcare. Back in 2006, it was like a, a crisis. There was, I just remember it was just amazing that there weren't anywhere near enough places. The policy that, that council put together, I think I need to declare that it was after I was on council, but, um, but I spent a lot of time you know, on working up, helping work up the policy. Um, my, my understanding of childcare is probably anchored in that document and anchored in that debate. And, and it is anchored in that idea that uh, council decided to, you know, to choose to put extra into it um, with subsidies to provide either more affordable childcare or higher quality childcare, whichever, which, however that subsidy worked out which is a public benefit, and it did stand up as some sort of um, justification in, in terms of the competition policy. Now, the competition policy might have changed since then. There's a whole lot of stuff that I don't understand in great detail about it, but I, would have, I, I personally would like to see um, those terms, and the, and the term quality, which was always associated with those subsidies, that were, I would like to see that addressed in the debate that we have about this and the discussion we have this. This this executive summary of the policy mentions quality once, as far as I can see. Well, it, it repeats the same mention of it. Um, I would just like to be helped out of the 2006 and into the modern world with, with some explicit comparison and acknowledgement and comparison of, 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 of what we had then and what we have now. Um, just, just really, just to help, to, to acknowledge that there, that with every improvement, with every uh, uh, evolution into the modern world, we lose certain things that that were valuable before, and it was really we must have that opportunity to try and either recover those things that are lost, or substitute for them, or you know, sort of um, somehow account for for those values, and I. Uh, I've read the whole policy. I haven't understood everything in it. I imagine that almost all of what I'm asking is in there somewhere. But I just, uh, I just want to say, please take note of those, um, of those arguments, the comments that will come in, and the arguments that we need to develop. I'm, I'm certainly not against changing things for 2019 at all, but I do want to be able to see um, a, a, an argument that acknowledges those rather than just assumes that they've already been. Um, swept uh, and, and agreed to and uh, assumed. Um, with that, let's put it out there um, and let's have that discussion. I, I'm very happy with where we are at the moment. Any further speakers? Um, I don't wish to close. 
I move to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thanks very much. Um, could we get Councillor Pearl? Good to be back. <laughs> That's great to have you back. Good to see you. 10.1, awarding tender number 2184, the foreshore public space lighting renewal station pier to Kerford Road. Um, councillors, any questions? Oh, Councillor Voss. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to understand why there is a reduction in the number of lights by 10 in that space. Um, is it because they're more efficient in their lighting? I'm just wondering how, you, how you're getting to that. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Uh, yeah, so it's, there's a lighting design that uh, basically sets out the amount of light needed and the poles are, uh, or the lights are, are set based on that. So a reduction of light uh, would still mean that we're lighting up the path as much as we need to, even though we're not using as many lights. Councillor Pearl? I've got a couple. The first one is the, the lights are in bad condition, particularly between... Um, no, actually, what I was about to say is wrong. I'll just correct myself in my midway in my question. Um, never stop me, Councillor. That's all right. Um, why are we doing this section of lights versus the next section? So there was quite a serious sexual assault two years ago in the next section, uh, which happened pretty early in the morning and for security point of views I'm just wondering why have we picked this section of lighting versus the next section of lighting further down the line to St Kilda and um, what's your plans in terms of uh, remedying that section in terms of uh, security lighting in particular? We may have to take that one on notice, uh, sorry, through you Mr Mayor, we may have to take that one on notice as to why this section has been chosen, um, no, but no. this section did enable us to look at a long section of lights so that would able to be, be repaired, uh, sorry, to be replaced. Um, originally we looked at doing this in stages to actually fit the budget uh, to be able to do it, so we didn't actually anticipate that we would be able to replace this entire section of lights uh, in one financial year, but we've received quite a competitive price through the procurement process. Um, in terms of why this entire section was actually chosen, we'll have to get back to you. Councillors, I uh, neglected to call on a member of the community to speak to us. Robin Yeager. Niagui. Look, no one can pronounce my name, so my vengeance on the world. Could I ask you please to read your name and address in, and uh, suburb into the record, please? Sure. Robbie, um, Robbie Nyagui. Uh, Nyagui? It's not spelled that way. Um, let me just pull up my notes. Apologies. Yeah. No, I've lost it. Did your computer yeah, go bye-bye? No, there we go. Um, so I want to speak very briefly. I think it's great that the lights are being replaced. I think particularly in terms of the environmental outcomes and also light pollution. Obviously, it's something we don't talk about a lot, but um, the impact on local bird life, particularly of poor outdoor lighting, is pretty significant. That said, I guess I was kind of dismayed to see that the, the new lights don't really have any kind of, um, I guess, what I probably better term, heritage impact on, on the foreshore. As someone who's kind of grown up in, in this area and, and kind of grown up around this foreshore, I think every, every piece of the foreshore is something that should be protected and considered. Um, and although it's important that we always attempt to improve the amenity of the, of the space that we've got, I think it's also important that we look back and, and consider the, the, the foundations of, of what's there. Um, the current gooseneck lights, although certainly not what was there 150 years ago or 100 years ago, do nod in the direction um, of the kind of Victorian era promenade that that, the, that particularly along that section uh, from West Pavilion to Station Pier is pretty prominent, obviously with the stone wall. Uh, and I guess I was kind of curious to see whether Council had had any kind of consideration of that as part of making the decision to go with quite a contemporary light design. Um, and I guess whether 
as part of the decisions around the foreshore, things around that kind of um, design elements are made. Obviously, there's, there's broader master plans, but in terms of that really detailed sort of the texture of that of that foreshore environment, a council having those considerations. Because um, I mean, it's, it's interesting of note that the phrase like you know that the lights have been there for many years. And so for me, as a 27-year-old, for me, they've always been there, uh, and they are kind of intrinsic to that space. Obviously, for others, that would be different, but I think that's something that's important to consider when, you know, when replacing every little bit of the, of the foreshore. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Mr Niagui. Did I get it right? <laughs> um, OK, Councillor... Sorry to interrupt you, Councillor. Right. Councillor Brand. I'd just like to follow up on a, both of those questions, actually. The level of lighting, I'm, uh, look, um, I, I feel like now I'm reminiscing. When I was on council last time, um, we uh, introduced a lighting, uh, a lighting regime that actually included a, a form of lighting that, although it was uh, relatively dimmer than what we were using before, and certainly less uh, energy, um, energy greedy, um, even though it was dimmer, it actually had a better resolution of some sort. I can't tell you what the technical term is. But you were actually able to see people's faces, for instance, from further away, clearly illuminated in this light, even though the light was dimmer than the, than the big lights that we were using before. And I'm just wondering whether, this is, whether there is a, a march of progress that finds us in 2019, uh, considering that type of technical specification um, in order to reduce the amount of light, um, even though it is more efficient lighting. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. So uh, there's an Australian standard now for lighting, particularly for uh, pedestrian lighting. And the change in lighting, uh, that, which I think is what you're alluding to, the the, uh, it's more directional, um, it's, a, it's a warmer light in LED, but it still has um, the ability for people to see uh, faces, as you've noted. So it, it actually improves that aspect as well. Um, just on a related question, partly, um, uh, partly prompted by Mr Niagui. Um, uh, Policy on light pollution, light spill, um, the the nighttime atmosphere, the um, uh, the effect on bird life, the effect on anim night, on nocturnal animal life, and the effect on nocturnal human life. Um, can you just uh, tell us what principles you're working to, in order to reduce to keep the amount of light to the the bare minimum for suitable safety standards, as opposed to um, just just assuming that the more you flood, flood light a place and the safer it is, the better it'll be. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, there are some guidelines on what sort of light um, actually has the least impact on insects, bird life, nocturnal animals. Um, these lights are between 3,000 and 3,500 Kelvin, which falls into that range where it has a limited impact uh, on nocturnal animals. So that has been a key factor that we've included in the design of these lights. Um, anything on... I mean, that's very good to hear, I've got to say, but anything on, um, on, uh, on atmosphere of, like, keeping, keeping the night the night scene sort of uh, dark rather than totally bright, um, even though we obviously need to maintain you know, an, an obvious amount of safety standards in that. Through you, Mr Mayor. Uh, yes, so there's sort of night sky recommendations and uh, these lights certainly comply with that. So there's no upward lighting. It's very directional and, and facing down. So they certainly comply uh, with night sky requirements. I'll take up Mr Niagui's um, question around the heritage. I guess it hadn't really occurred to me when reading the document. Um, 
do those lights that were currently exist have heritage overlay or significance? And was that a factor? I, I mean, I do know that we've done Elwood light upgrades, so are we just sort of matching? Is that kind of more of the consideration? Through you, Mr Mayor. The lights along the foreshore, they're not heritage. They, they were installed in the late 80s, we believe, in the bicentenary. Uh, so not heritage. And you're right in saying that they're matching the, the recent lights that went down at Moran and Marina Reserves. So they're very, well, they're exactly the same, the poles. Yep. Councillor Voss. Thank you. Um, so mine was about the consistency of style all the way along. Um, we seem to have, whenever we do a new contract for lights, a different light style. Is this the way we're going to do our whole foreshore or are we, are we settling on a standard? I'm, you know, I'm, I, I note from Princess Pier to the docks, for example, was only recently put in and had a different, recently, like five years ago, had a different sort of look. We've got the ones in Elwood have another look. What are we doing? Through you, Mr Mayor. Uh, yes, it, we, we are trying to certainly, uh, with these new lights, um, really identify, I suppose, a certain section of the foreshore. So the lights uh, sort of around the, the Esplanade are quite different, but they're, we're, we're trying to get some consistency for sure. So these are exactly the same as the Elwood to Moran lighting, exactly the same. So it's... it's the poles, the lights, everything. Yep. Long live, Mark. Um, Councillor Pearl. One of the things I've been trying to get my head around since I've been on council is to work out why things cost so much. So these will cost about just under $10,000 per light pole, six metres high. Um, I'm wondering, we went out to tender, we selected what we wanted, then we went out to tender. Would it be better to go out to tender with a specification of installing lights and then get options in uh, according to environmental specifications, economic specifications, to get options from the market as opposed to us just going to them saying this is what we want to get a better financial outcome for ratepayers? Um, through you, Mr Mayor, it's always a balance about doing, you know, over-specifying and sort of painting yourself into a corner where there's only uh, a few options that the market can price and about going down the performance specification path, which is what, um, what you're speaking of. Um, in this case, we wanted to get... One of the key objectives was to get consistency, so that's why we specified the lights to be the same as what's been installed at Moran Reserve. Um, as part of the tender, we did ask for a few different options. So we looked at different materials for the poles to be... Uh, uh, fabricated from because it doesn't really matter if they're made out of different materials. Uh, we also looked at alternatives for the installation of the conduits. There's a lot of cost that's related to the installation of the conduits between the poles as well. So we looked for um, contractors to come back to us or tenderers to come back to us with different options in that regard. But we do try and find a balance between over-specifying and making it too specific and limiting the market's ability to be able to, to innovate and provide us with cost-effective solutions. <coughs> What's the, what is the lifespan of such a light? Do we get 10 years out of it, 20, tell me, <laughs> as long as possible? Through you, Mr Mayor, we expect a 25 to 30 year lifespan for the pole. Uh, you know, technology could change over, over the years for the LEDs, but uh, for the pole, which is the thing that sort of, you know, is most intrinsic to the design, 25 to 30 years. OK. Councillors. I think we've exhausted questions. Do we have a resolution? I, I, I move Councillor Voss, seconded Councillor Brand. Moved and seconded. Can we have a few words, Councillor Voss? Or may we? I, I don't need to speak to it, no. Councillor Brand? Yes, I'll just say, um, just commenting on the previous discussion, I, for one, I think the design is a really uh, nice design. I think it's, uh, it's, it's handsome and simple. And I've, I understand the sentimental attachment to the gooseneck ones. But to say it's not heritage, it's not heritage rated. It is actually quite a respectable postmodern design from the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind somebody saying that we've got to keep them, but I think that uh, what we're putting in now is actually really very smart. 
and, um, and uh, very appropriate and uh, will serve us very well. And I'm happy with all the other specifications that seem to have gone into it. I'm just going to say a few words because this is a tender and uh, when you look at the tenders I take on board what uh, Councillor Voss has said, you know, it does seem a lot of money but they are new poles and um, it is new technology. Um, the tender winner, High Access Group, wasn't the cheapest tender going but very close to it. And whenever I go down to the foreshore I feel an overwhelming sense of shame because there are a whole pack of lights that actually don't light. And I think I would have voted on lots of them. The existing lighting fails the dark sky compliance because it uh, reflects upwards as well as downwards. And the lights are unbaffled. These are focused and baffled and therefore have a higher environmental rating from a number of attributes. And... Uh, um, and uh, less, uh, cost less to, to run and actually do their job, which is lighting the footpath. Do you wish to close, Councillor Boss? I'll go move to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it carried. Um, Thanks very much. 11.1, uh, Graffiti Management Plan, public consultation. There are no members of the public who wish to speak to this. Um, councillors, any questions or motions? Oh, Councillor Voss. Just like to ask um, for you, Mayor, um, how the, pre the precinct locations were um, decided on? Through you, Mr Mayor. Uh, the precinct locations have been determined through a series of data review that's been completed over the last three years, identifying where the highest graffiti reporting and removal rates have occurred. Thanks, Ms Taylor. I'll move to the um, asking uh, whether they, we have a resolution. Does anyone wish to move the officer's recommendation? Move Councillor Crawford. Second to Councillor Voss. Do you wish to speak, Councillor Crawford? Yes, I do. Um, I know that graffiti is something that dismays many of our community, um, and it is so relentless. And I know that we do a, a decent job, but I think it's kind of the extent of graffiti is, is not defeating us, but it, it's just hard to keep catching up that... Uh, catching up to the prolific tagging that is taking place. I do want to acknowledge um, the officers involved in um, putting this report together and some of the actions that um, we are already, Holly, seeing the results of your hard work in the community. Um, but of course there is always more and that will probably always be the case with the graffiti. So I, I really encourage the community to um, feed into this process. We want to get on top of it as much as you do and we are ob obviously looking for those partnerships where other asset um, holders have to do their bit as well in our community, um, seeking grants and seeking it at a statewide and inner citywide because we can't do it all on our own. So I really um, uh, endorse a lot of the ideas in this management plan. Councillor Voss? Yes, this is also a... Uh a topic that um, interests me greatly and I get a lot of um, communication from the community on. Uh, a lot of the community tell me that it makes them feel unsafe when they see graffiti, um, illegal graffiti around the place and um, they have an expectation that it's cleaned up. This um, draft graffiti management plan addresses a lot of the issues that we've, we've um, experienced and that we've had feedback from the community so I'm very happy to endorse that it gets released out to the community for feedback. So I just wanted to thank all the community that have actually um, participated in um, the project so far and, and submitted their ideas to this um, plan and also to thank the officers for getting to, to this, this point. I note that we've come a long way, you know, in the last, I don't know, 12 months um, in terms of how we're addressing graffiti in our, in our, uh, in our community. And um, this is just another... 
um, leap forward for the next five years. So I'm very excited to see this play out. Thank you. Councillor Brand. I also want to note that there are quite a lot of citizens in the city who, when they see graffiti, they feel actually that they are living in a vibrant contemporary city as well. Um, and I think it's really important to be able to uh, not just condemn graffiti 100%, but to actually have a sensibility that's, that, can, that can find a balance and draw a line somewhere. And I feel the, this report, and I feel our officers who are in charge of this actually do have that understanding of the, of the uh, competing values there. And I feel very confident in what they've come up with and very appreciative of um, the way that they apply it. I, 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 um, that's basically what I want to say. And uh, so thank you, and I, and I think it's a good policy. Thank you. Look, I, I want to reiterate similar attitudes. I, I think that um, in this area with Ms Taylor, Ms Blair and Mr Benazic, we have our real high achievers and they do great work every day. I have to represent the views of some of my family members who are real fans of graffiti and all of their friends who've gone on to work in the arts community, unfortunately, have started in graffiti. Um, so, are there any... Do you wish to close? Move to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thanks very much. 12.1, St Kilda Marina Interim Lease, review of submissions. We have a number of members of the community who wish to speak to us on this matter, and I'm going to ask them to speak in order in which I receive the... Uh, um, receive the um, uh, request to speak. And the first is Andrew Barlow. Ms Barlow, could I ask you to grab that seat over there, read your name and suburb into the record, please? Sure. Is that on? Can everyone it hear me? It is. Uh, yes, I'm Andrew Barlow. I'm a director of Australian Marina Development Corporation. Well, um, first of all, thank you, Mayor Gross and councillors, for allowing Australian Marina Development Corporation to uh, be heard here tonight in relation to its submission. Uh, I also have with me here tonight co-directors David Heffernan and Christo Van Egmond. Uh, just for the record, I've, I've lived in, Port, in the Port Phillip area uh, in St Kilda and Elwood for most of my 20s and 30s, uh, and me and my wife Vanessa remain ratepayers with a, a property in Addison Street, Elwood, just near uh, the marina. I'm also a, a boat owner and uh, have been a wet berth tenant at St Kilda Marina for all but two of the last 12 years. But look, given the three minute time limit, I'll keep this brief. Um, I'd like to preface what I'm about to say with two important points. Uh, first, it's important for Council to note that we've made our submission based on the limited information in the public domain. Uh, there is certain information and details which we have requested, uh, but at this time we've not yet been provided with those details. So please understand our submission is made without full knowledge of all the particulars that uh, councillors and um, council officers have been privy to. Uh, secondly, as part of our submission, we've put forward an alternative or alternative indicative terms for an interim lease. Now, I just want to make it very clear that we have done so not because we desperately want to uh, take over the short-term lease, uh, because this may prejudice, in fact, our participation in the long-term competitive pro tender process, which is really where our real commercial interest lies. Uh, we've put forward an alternative because, fundamentally, we do not believe it is in the best interests of council, uh, ratepayers, the community, marina tenants and boat owners to delay the long-term leasing process by three years, which is uh, essentially what Council's signing up to in agreeing to this proposed interim lease uh, with the current tenant. Further, given the current lease is set to expire at the end of April this year, uh, we do not see how the current tenant would be in any way disadvantaged by entering into a one- or two-year term uh, versus a three-year term. However, all other stakeholders are disadvantaged uh, by the longer three-year term. We therefore strongly encourage Council to reject the current proposal and, if possible, renegotiate the term such that it's on an annual basis to allow for quicker and more timely progression 
of the long-term leasing process, which is really what matters here. This would obviously be for the benefit of everyone. In summary, Mr Mayor, uh, we object to the interim leasing arrangement on its current terms. However, we're not here to uh, delay or upset any process. Uh, AMDC are here to provide Council with a viable alternative solution should Council need to explore that option to avoid any further delays to the long-term leasing process. Uh, we thank you again, Mr Mayor and Councillors, for your time and consideration. Thanks very much, Mr Barlow. I'm sorry for keeping you so long and all the other speakers keeping you so long with the other debates. Um, Mr David Heffernan. Once again, thank you, uh, Mayor Gross and Council, for allowing AMDC to be heard today with reference to the interim lease. Um, my name is David Heffernan from AMDC, and uh, following on from Andrew's uh, comments before regarding operational expertise, uh, AMDC is here to support the Council's concerns that were, some of them have been raised as an alternative party's managing the interim lease. Um, we thought it would be beneficial uh, to officially present to Council the credentials of uh, AMDC group of companies uh, as we've been actively developing, upgrading existing marinas through staging processes um, and operating them globally for 60 years. Uh, we have over 25 million square feet of uh, pontoons in the water worldwide. We've built a lot of uh, different marinas throughout the Port Phillip Bay. Um, couple that together with our uh, other experience of integrating uh, marina communities. We've just finished a floating community. Uh, we've just also uh, built, um, upgraded a lot of other uh, marinas that uh, based on latest demand studies and other things that, um, that brings the marina up to speed in terms of what the, what's the boat demand is these days and what the community's needs are. Um, Further to that, we, um, we conducted an internal review process of the uh, technical one of the marina, because obviously we're looking at it, and, uh, and a lot of our stakeholders have their boats there and love the marina. And, um, and what came out of that was um, even, even if uh, for the interim uh, lease to go forward, we were looking at we'd have to upgrade some things immediately to meet OH&S issues. Um, obviously, when the marina was designed and built, you know, 30 plus years ago, uh, there's different things where the Australian standards now have a clear set of guidelines uh, which would have to be adhered to, otherwise, it'd be liabilities. So, we highlighted some of those and we'd be more than happy to share any of those. I suppose, in summary, Mr. Mayor, I hope that the Port Phillip uh, City Council has the confidence that, that AMDC has the necessary credentials and operational experience and uh, and I know we submitted, as Andrew mentioned, documentation, um, so I think we supported that with some hard copies as well. In closing, I suppose for probity reasons, that I'd just like to add that this is not to support any of, uh, of our long-term tender submission, and, uh, and we're really, um, uh, really happy that we obviously had the opportunity tonight to, uh, to hear from us and the, and the fellow directors. So thank you very much, everyone, and Mayor, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks very much. I Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Can Andrew? Uh, you mentioned you were, your company has built or run or refurbished other marinas in Port Phillip Bay. Which which ones are they? Sorry, um, it's Bellingham Marine we're talking about with John Sprague, who uh, I know you're familiar with maybe. Uh, they just upgraded the Royal uh, Squadron with the breakwater and, and the marina there. They also just upgraded Blair Gowrie. Uh, we've also done the second and third stage of Docklands, um, and there's another. We'd also uh, done another small extension just in the bay now for a private client. Um, we're also uh, just finished Werribee, uh, where we're doing another extension now. I had meetings myself last week with the investor group about looking at how they could integrate the uh, upland works with the marina, so it has a better uh, community feel and, and with restaurants and boat ramps and things like this. So. We've done a lot of work in, in uh, obviously in Port Phillip Bay, Australia, and uh, which we're proud of, and worldwide. Good question. Thanks very much, Dave. Thank you. Lindsay Gordon.
Mr Mayor, councillors, um, I'm speaking on behalf of the ratepayers of Port Phillip Inc. Uh, we made a written submission, but I've got a bit of extra stuff to uh, add to it because we didn't really have enough information and I was waiting on that. Um, the original lease, the proposed draft lease, the property rental valuation and the rental paid by the sub-tenants were requested but were not available and therefore assumptions have to be made. Uh, I recommend that you don't approve the uh, proposed three-year lease as negotiated because financially it doesn't stack up and there are other alternative ways the Council can go about this. The rent to be received is $134,000 per annum plus 7% of various activities and as an aside I don't understand why the Council is even uh, receiving a percentage of the business. It doesn't make sense. It owns the land. It should just receive the rental and not something that needs to be checked or audited. Um, this would make a total amount paid to Council of approximately $254,000 per annum. The valuation for rental purposes was $800,000 per annum. This is a loss to the Council of $546,000 per annum, i.e. 70% of the expected fair rent is lost. But, in addition, the tenant is allowed to keep the following. 93% of the various activities, which is about $1.7 million, plus rent from all 11 subleases, Look, I had to make estimates. I think that these are low. The BP petrol station, around 120,000 per annum. Riva Bar, approximately 60,000 per annum. Perhaps the other nine leases, 75,000 per annum. The total receipts for the Australian marinas are just under 2 million per annum, plus the lease discount of 546,000. But Council also pays 620000 for the fences, wet burrs and, and so on at the end of the lease. The grand total received by the marina over three years is about $6.5 Council gets 750000 over three years instead of $2.4 which would be assessed at $800,000 per annum. Doesn't pass the pub test, as I say. No matter what the case, why is Australian Marinas receiving any of the sub-rentals? All of it should go to the Council from now and then only the remaining lease, the remaining area lease to the marina operator. A lot more simple, gives sub-tenants more security. So, so the, the fear the, the, is that Australian Marinas will leave boat owners high and dry, so to speak, and there would be a major disruption to the marina. That's not the case. The Council is not out on a limb and does not have to kowtow to threats. Take this scenario. If a fair rent is not agreed on, then on 30th March this year, the Council could give one month's notice for the tenant to vacate and you take possession. The existing lease is not governed by the Retail Tenancies Act, but any new lease would be. Council immediately automatically receives all sub-lease rentals. Just like a bank finance or financier taking possession of a business that appoints an administrator, you appoint a manager who would supervise the removal of agreed items under the lease by the marina oper operator while they vacate. In any event, um, as a lawyer, I would question all the improvements uh, revert to council. Um, I think that there's many other ways to do it, and unfortunately my notes are too long, but I'd like to implore the councillors to have a direct confidential meeting with your lawyers uh, urgently before the 30th of March to work out the best possible way to go and have direct answers to your questions because financially this is a disaster for the council and ratepayers and another method would be a win for boat owners, a win for council, a win for ratepayers, a win for the sub-tenants and the only person losing would be the marina. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thanks, Lindsay. Richard Spooner. Good evening, Mr Mayor, councillors, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Richard Spooner and I'm here representing Australia Marinas and the Spooner family, the founders and operators of St Kilda Marina. At this stage, I trust you have taken time to read our submission left with council last week. Today, we are here to decide upon what an orderly orderly transition looks like at the end of what is irrefutably a successful 50-year partnership between my family and council. I am third generation of the Spurners to operate and manage St Kilda Marina and I take this opportunity to acknowledge on the record the remarkable vision of my grandfather, Arch Spurner, 
that led to the creation of this important and enduring piece of community infrastructure. To understand my family's motive, motivation as to what it relates to what we believe an orderly transition would look like, it is important council and the community understand the broader Spooner family business interests. At the outset, and for the avoidance of doubt, my family's priority is to execute on a transition that respects the community, community's best interests and respects the legacy we have created with council. In addition to St Kilda Marina, my family is also a market leader in marine and property development industry. Over the past 50 years, my family has built over 55,000 Caribbean branded boats and is the owner and developer of Caribbean Park, a multi-use, multi-billion dollar asset in Melbourne's southeast. My family holds no debt whatsoever with these businesses. With this back backdrop, therefore, let there be no misunderstanding that all we seek is a fair and respectful outcome for all concerned. With less than six weeks before our lease expires and the community unnecessarily exposed, we reiterate what Australian Marinas and my family are committed to offering council. Certainty of operation beyond the current lease expiry for a period of three years on terms openly and fairly negotiated and agreed with council, the sale of the marina infrastructure at the expiry of the three-year extension for $620,000. We note that this figure was only agreed by council after independent advice, and we also bring to council's attention that new infrastructure would exceed $7 million, as well as having a procure procurement program well beyond the current lease expiry. We are disappointed that despite actively seeking agreement months in advance of lease expiry, I stand before council and the community still without clarity as to what will now become of the marina and its operation come 1st of May, given the aforementioned deal has still not been finalised at this stage. Accordingly, to bring much needed direction for our business and importantly the community, we would like council with the strongest recommendations to make a decision without delay whereby Council execute upon the already negotiated and arranged three-year lease extension, dissolving any uncertainty we see articulated here tonight. As this opportunity may not present in the future, allow me to formally thank Council officers and staff for their assistance throughout this process and thank Council on behalf of my family for their wonderful partnership over five decades. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Spooner. Rhonda Small. Elizabeth Meredith. No rush, no rush. Good evening, councillors. My name is Elizabeth Meredith, and I'm a director of Warilda, which is currently renting the land associated with Rollo's kiosk. I wish to speak to you directly as a stakeholder on behalf of the kiosk and indirectly for the restaurant, The Great Provider, in which I also have an interest. To talk to the interim lease, for the community and council, and obviously for ourselves, we want to see the marina area retain a full degree of activity while the tender is being decided. If the right outcomes do not occur, this area will go slowly into decline with possible downgrading of activity should there be closures, problems with the wet berths or even removal of structures. Uh, in any agreement made by council with an incoming head tenant, 
Wurilda would therefore be concerned about maintaining the standards of the buildings that are there, the infrastructure, the subtenant rental levels, and any interference caused by any preliminary dis demolition or similar activity. Now, I fully realise that some of the material I speak to is covered in the, re the report that you, your people have uh, drawn up. But that report is only recommendations. What we would look for is more um, to have it included as part of the inter um, excuse me, as a subtenant, I would request council to include the things I'm going to speak to in any interim lease agreements that you make. Now, the first one that I want to speak to is that the lease agreements contain clauses which ensure maintenance and repairs across the interim period. period. Although some structures may be removed or altered under the later redevelopment, it is important that they are appropriately repaired and maintained. <laughs> then the subtenants are provided with leases. I want, I want to ask that subtenants be provided with leases at a market valuation, which relates to the temporary nature of the lease. The re the, uh, currently, a requested rental and associated in increases for, our, for this temporary lease requested by the current head tenant becomes much higher than our current rental and has required a 4% per annum increase uh, during the interim period. This would mean that by the time later in the period that the rental for our little kiosk, which is only the land and the thing, would be the same as the total rental which the uh, head tenant is current, would be paying. We plan, therefore, to negotiate for a reasonable rental and we are doing this by getting a professional valuation to be done. Such a high rent otherwise would affect the viability. Very quickly, there are any other preliminary works associated with a new tender do not interfere with ongoing marina activities we would request to be incorporated in any lease. That council work together with the head tenant that you choose and stakeholders to maintain and possibly improve community activity in this area. I thank you. If these outcomes are achieved with the cooperation of all parties, then it would be possible to have a positive, viable, community-oriented oriented outcome. Thank you. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. I note that um, Rhonda's returned. OK. Peter Holland? Uh, Peter Holland, St Kilda. Uh, I'm not going to address the um, merits of the proposed interim lease. I just want to raise three pieces of information that I think would be useful for the councillors and the community leading up to the April 3 meeting. Uh, and the first is some independent expert advice on the time frame that we're looking at. Uh, the proposed interim lease is for three years, which is uh, manifestly excessive, I, I think. And the question is, can a long-term lease be processed within 12 months or, at the worst, 24 months? If so, the officers should be given the responsibility and the resources so to do. And I think that, that we need some expert independent advice. And I believe that the top cat in this field is international marina consultants in Queensland who would be able to give advice. And I think that the officers are already aware of these consultants. Um, so if we can process the long-term lease more quickly, then we should be looking at an offering an interim lease of one year by one year by one year. Let's get the show on the road as quickly as reasonably possible. The second piece of information that I think would be useful for councillors and the community is some legal advice on whether the Crown Land Reserves Act applies. Now, the Crown Land Reserves Act has detailed procedures and considerations in the granting of leases on Crown land. The officer's current position, which is different from their earlier position, is that this act doesn't apply to the St Kilda Marina, which is governed under its own act of 1965. Uh, the, Crown lands the Crown Lands Reserves Act was passed 13 years after the St Kilda Land Act, 
But it has, of course, transition provisions in Section 4.4. It catches Crown land reservations made before 1978, and this seems to me to apply to the St Kilda Marina. Uh, the St Kilda Marina was reserved back in 1880, and even the St Kilda Land Act itself appoints the Council Committee of Management under the 1958 Land Act. So it would seem to me that the Council, in granting leases over the St Kilda Marina, is caught by both the St Kilda Land Act and the Crown Leases Reserves Act. Now this is important because the consequences are dramatic if Council isn't acting properly. The guidelines say, and I quote, the legislative requirements must be addressed to ensure the lease is valid, and if these are not fulfilled, the lease may be void, unenforceable, or have unintended consequences. So for God's sake, let's get it right. I've asked the officers and the department for their legal advice and it hasn't been provided. I haven't received any love from them yet. So I think that the council should make sure that, there's, that they've got proper legal advice on whether the Crown Land Reserves Act applies because if it doesn't apply to the interim lease, it doesn't apply to the 50-year lease. And that would be absolutely bizarre. <coughs> so please get legal advice and make it available to the community as well. The third piece of information that I think would be useful is information from the alternative uh, proponent for the interim lease. Um, the officers in their emails to me have said that the key factor in their recommendation for the uh, proposed lease is that the current operator owns the infrastructure. Now, AMD say that they can guarantee continuity of operations and I think that uh, Council could perhaps invite them to explain in more detail just how this could be achieved and what further information they require. So they're the three pieces of information that I think would be quite valuable for both the councillors and the community leading up to the meeting where the lease is actually approved or some other action is taken. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Robbie Nyagwi. time in one evening, councillors. Uh, it's Robbie Nyagwi from St Kilda. Um, so I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the Community Alliance of Port Phillip and also from my own personal experiences sitting on the uh, St Kilda Marina community panel last year. Uh, obviously this um, opportunity doesn't come up very often. This is something that's been in 50 years in the making and once it's passed, it's another 50 years before we have another opportunity again. I mean, for my own self, when, if we do this three years and then at 50 years, I'll be 80 years old by the time this comes up again. So this really is, I think for everyone in this room, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And CAP's really keen to make sure that that is harnessed to the best of its ability and that the benefit of that site is, is, is ultimately given to the rest of the community. So we can understand why it's important to potentially take more time to ensure that the long-term lease does deliver the benefits to the community that we all want to see. Something that I certainly found as a member of the community panel was that the current site is underutilised, it has issues, um, and it's been underinvested in, some would say, over the last little while, and we are really keen to see the next 50 years deliver a lot more benefits to the community more broadly. That said, um, we have a number of concerns about the proposed um, three-year interim lease negotiated directly with um, Australian marinas. Um, firstly, Council's undertaken a direct process of negotiation with Australian Marinas for a short-term lease, something that is at odds with its off-stated commitment to have competitive tendering processes. Um, and CAP would really like to see the documentation and, and uh, legal and, of course, ministerial advice that supports them having taken this action in relation to this piece of Crown land. Um, secondly, uh, Councillors um, has entered into an agreement with Australian Marinas to buy the marina infrastructure valued at um, $650,000 um, or possibly the new lessee at the end of the three-year lease um, should they be unsuccessful. Um, an independent assessment of this infrastructure should be received by Council and noted at Council meeting... Um, oh, sorry. An independent assessment of this infrastructure um, has been received by Council and noted at the Council meeting on the 6th of February, which apparently states that the marine infrastructure in question has a life of up to 15 years beyond the end of the marina's um, short-term lease, um, but this report hasn't been received. Um, CAP asked Council to make the marine infrastructure assessment report public prior to the hearings to be held, um, which submitters are able to speak to submissions. And CAP, um, 
and this is something for, I've come and coming from my own experiences on the marina panel, it's pretty clear to us that there's going to be a pretty significant upgrade of the facilities at the marina over the next 50 years. Um, and most of the information we received as community panels led us to believe that it would be very, very unlikely that the wet burrs and the existing infrastructure would be there in 15 years, that the incoming tenant would be obligated under the new agreement to do a pretty significant upgrade and that a lot of that material would be removed. So it seems kind of puzzling to us that this major financial commitment will be made for a, a supposed 15-year life when a lot of that infrastructure is going to be replaced. Um, I think really the idea that you would um, make this commitment when the new lease also hasn't been heard from yet, we don't know that that necessarily want um, this infrastructure going forward. It seems pretty crazy to have um, council make such a significant commitment. Um, we're also concerned about the low rent um, on the site. Um, although um, you know, we say we don't want the rental amount to disadvantage either party, it's important to recognise that as um, members of this city, we are disadvantaged by having such a low rent over the next three years. Um, let me just wrap up quickly. Um, and finally, I guess it's the length of the time. We were really keen to see um, a much shorter time period. There really is no suggestion as to why it would take three years to do this. Uh, I can understand that you've negotiated an agreement with Australian Marines, but we think a, a period of at least, of a, of a maximum of two years would be, would be necessary to get the long-term lease underway, and we're really keen to see that done. Otherwise, uh, an open tender process undertaken. Thank you. Thanks very much, Robbie. And finally, Andy Mullins. Good evening. Uh, I'm Frida Relic. You're not, not Andy, Andy Mullins. Mullins. I'll do an impersonation. It's OK. Uh, Mayor so and councillors, I'm here to read the following statement on behalf of Andy Mullins, who is a tenant at St Kilda Marina, a director of the Sand Hill Road Group and co-owner of the Hotel Esplanade, known as the ESPY in St Kilda. And he says, as both a wet berth boat tenant of St Kilda Marina and as a commercial operator of the Esplanade Hotel, we have a keen interest in the future of St Kilda Marina. We are concerned that council is considering entering into an interim lease of St Kilda Marina for a three year period, delaying the long term leasing process unnecessarily we would like to register our support for the submission made by Australian Marina Development Corporation in regards to reducing the interim lease term and strongly encourage Council to negotiate a shorter term lease in the best interests of Marina tenants, um, tenants and the community. Thank you. Thanks. Freda, could I ask you to fill out one of the blue forms later? Councillors, questions? Councillor Bond? Um, one of the submissions, or actually a couple of the submissions, have made a claim that the proposed lease is unlawful, um, primarily on the basis that we have not received approval from the Governor in Council on the recommendation of the Minister prior to entering into this lease. Are you able to, um, I guess, put it on record and explain to the members of the community that have this um, perception or this, or of this opinion that, that what we've done here is unlawful, the process for this lease and, and why it is that the process we are following is lawful and at what point in time the Governor and Council and the recommendation from the Minister will, will come to play in this leasing process? Through you, Mr Mayor. The process that we are following is lawful. Um, officers are not recommending to Council that they undertake an unlawful process for leasing. The process that we are following is recommended by DAWP, so we've been working very closely with our partners in state government to design the process end-to-end -end for both the short-term lease and the long-term lease, and that process uh, is being followed, and so that is based on legal advice um, and the advice from DAWP. Uh, and so the, the site does have complexity. There is a number of pieces of legislation that apply to the site, 
Um, and so that is why it has been very important that we act very cautiously and make sure that we're working very closely with our partners in state government on this. The key piece of legislation that relates specifically to this site is the St Kilda Land Act. It is the specific piece of legislation that applies to the leasing of, um, of the site and that means then that other legislation that is less specific does not apply where the Land Act does apply. Uh, and so it is confusing and um, we have actually just uploaded an FAQ to the website that explains this in more detail. Uh, but the Crown Land Reserves Act does apply, but it does not apply where the St Kilda Land Act applies. And so the St Kilda Land Act is the act that is being followed for the, for the leasing process, which requires that council um, have the approval from the minister to have the lease then go to the um, to the governor and council to approve, and um, so there is no requirement for approval to enter into negotiations for the lease, just for the lease to be approved at the end. However, of course, we are working very closely with Delwop to make sure that the lease that we propose is um, appropriate and will be acceptable. Good answer. Um, uh, Councillor Bond? So just to make that a little clearer, what we're doing now is the negotiation and once agreement is reached between council and the interim lease holder, whoever that may be, only then does the lease go to the governor and council for their approval. Three, Mr Mayor, yes, that's correct. Any further questions? Councillor Crawford. So as part of the process with this leasing, um, are there changes to the various acts that need to be made before we can go out to an EIOI for a, or the tender process, sorry, for a 50-year lease? Are there, are there things that will take a, a, a long time? Is, is part of the reason that we are going, um, the recommendation is for a, a longer lease? Through you, Mr Mayor. The the length of lease has been negotiated. It's a negotiated outcome. So council would have, uh, officers would have preferred to recommend a shorter lease um, and the proposed tenant would have preferred a longer lease. This is a negotiated outcome. So three years is a negotiated length of term. Um, however, it is a length of term that we think does fit within the process that is being proposed um, the leasing process won't take three years for the long-term lease. The, the, we're anticipating that we'll have a lease in place in 2020. However, it does allow for time for any new tenant transition um, planning, but also redevelopment plans because um, we anticipate that there will be significant redevelopment of the site associated with the future long-term lease. Um, Councillor Voss? Thank you. Um, there seemed to be a little bit of confusion tonight with some of the um, submitters about what we're actually doing. Um, and just wondering if you can explain what we're actually doing tonight um, in terms of the uh, Council's recommendation. Through you, Mr Mayor. Tonight is just the hearing of submissions uh, and the requiring a report to come back on the 3rd of April. Uh, where council will be requested to make a decision about the lease, but tonight it's really about just hearing the submissions. Good question. Councillor Crawford? Take your time, no rush. Fair enough. That's a good thing to think about. Um, so, uh, Councillor Crawford. Okay. Um, given we heard from um, some of the sub uh, lease or some tenants from the head tenant, um, is there any um, thing that we can put in the lease to assure um, any of, to cover any of those points Ms. Meredith mentioned? Is that is that um, with incapacity of the lease negotiation we are undergoing. Th 
through you, Mr Mayor. We will come back with more details in response in a couple of weeks' time when we report back on all those issues. But what I can say is that the interim lease needs to operate within the confines of the Retail Leases Act, which does put some constraints in terms of requirements that we can place on a um, tenant. So there's some of the things that you need to consider, but we'll advise you on that when we come back. I discern there are no further questions, so can we move to a resolution? Moved Councillor Bond, seconded Councillor Pearl. Sorry? Yes, I would <laughs> like to speak to the... Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so we're, we're here tonight. We're not here to, to make a decision on the lease. We're here tonight just to hear submissions and approve the hearing of these submissions. So it's not a yes or no, do we or do we not agree with the lease. It's great to hear that there are people out there who are very, very interested in, in this site. Um, from a point of view of where we're sitting, competition is good. In fact, competition is very good. So it's, it's great to know that this is going to be a very much sought after location. And we, we will, um, during that process, we will get a great outcome for the, the rate payers of Port Phillip and the residents of Port Phillip at some point in time in the future. But yeah, tonight is not the night to be say yes or no or what we do and don't like about the lease. It's just we're hearing submissions and we thank you all for coming along and, and providing us with some um, you know, very useful and highly interesting information as part of some of your submissions. Thanks. Councillor Pearl? Um, anyone else? Look, I just want to reiterate that I, I've learned a lot tonight. Oh, sorry, Councillor Brand. Why would you not look in my direction? <laughs> it's nothing personal, but... No, I just want to say it is tonight, is, uh, um, as Councillor Bond says, about receiving uh, these submissions, and I've read all or most of them myself, and I just want to say that we will... that there are lots of questions that we have been raised, and there are lots of questions that we'll ask, um, and I thank you for the submissions. Um, and uh, we'll be doing that over the next uh, couple of weeks. So, yeah. Thank you. Any further? All I wanted to say was I learned a lot tonight and I thank everyone for coming in and talking to us. Um, you don't wish to close? No. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thanks very much. Yeah, I, I think we put, keep pushing through. 14.1, Assembly of Councillors. Moved Councillor Voss, seconded Councillor Pearl. Speakers against or in favour? All those in favour? That's unanimous. 14.2, Proposed Tenancy Agreement, Elwood Croquet Club. Uh, you want to move? Move um, Councillor Crawford, seconded Councillor Gross. Speakers against? Or speakers, do you wish to speak to it? I love that we have a croquet club in our municipality <laughs> and, and <laughs> no, but, it, but they, it, they, they hire it for corporate things and they've had funding and I just think that it's, it's a lovely little quaint part of the gorgeous thing that makes up the fabric of um, Port Phillip, so I'm happy to um, move this recommendation. Well said. Um, any other speakers? Move to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Declare it carried unanimously. Um, property policy, communication and engagement. Any questions? There's no one from the public. Any questions? Moved to requesting a motion. Moved by a whole plethora of people. Councillor Copsey, breaking your duck tonight. And uh, Councillor Bond, seconding. Um, do you wish to speak? In case there's anyone watching along at home, because I note we've been deserted by all but the most faithful attendees. <laughs> um, so this is a really important policy. Uh, we 
deal regularly with individual leases that generate a huge amount of interest from the community, and this is our overarching attempt to um, update and improve our principles around Council's general property uh, approach to managing the property portfolio. Um, to put in place guiding principles that will mean that our community can have confidence that the public interest is being um, is being properly promoted when we are entering into um, a plethora of different agreements around our assets, and it's a very important one. I, you know, much as we deal with strategic planning issues, and then we have individual stat planning issues. I think that these guiding um, policies are actually really crucial. I would hope that some of those um, members of the community who are showing significant interest in individual planning uh, property matters will also contribute to um, the development of this one. It's going out there for uh, engagement and response, and I hope we'll get a good level of that. Good point. Um, second, I wish to speak. Who did second it? I've forgotten. Bond. Bond. Um, anyone else wish to speak? Move to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Um, notices of motion. We have no notices of motion tonight. Well, reports by councillor delegates. Could you do? Councillors, do we have any reports from councillor delegates? Yes, that would be me. <laughs> Thanks, Mr Mayor. I just wanted to acknowledge that Teresa, who is here faithfully, have you ever missed a council meeting in the last, I don't know how long, Teresa, was nominated um, recently at the Victorian Government um, Awards. It's the Molly Hadfield Award and the Francis Pennington. And there were three people from the South Melbourne nominated, and that is for um, their work to uh, fostering resilience and community cohesion in social um, housing. And Teresa, I know that you work tirelessly in that space and that it's not always easy, particularly at the moment. So I want to say thank you for your work. Um, I know that, you know, it's people like you that make our community a much better place. Good on you. Thanks very much for that. Coun Councillor Baxter. Uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to report back from the... Um, Association of Bayside Municipalities uh, elections that they held recently um, for the position of President and Vice President and the Executive. Uh, and I'm very uh, happy to announce that I've been elected as the President of the Association of Bayside Municipalities. Thanks for yawning part. while I <laughs> give that <laughs> report. Um, and that, uh, and that uh, Councillor Jonathan Marsden, uh, the Mayor of Hobsons Bay, was uh, elected the Vice President of the ABM. So I'm um, really forward, uh, lo looking forward to continuing to represent Port Phillip's interest on the ABM and taking a uh, greater hand in steering that organisation. Any more reports, delegates? Well, thanks very much. Um, 17, urgent business. Councillors, we've got five urgent business items tonight. I need a mover and seconder for council to consider five items of urgent business in relation to um, proposed motions for Australian Local Government Association National General Assembly. Moved Councillor Baxter, seconded Councillor Crawford. Sorry, I missed you over there, but... Um, I'll move to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried. Um, urgent Business 17.1, Item 1, Housing. So, um, moved Councillor Crawford. Do I have a seconder for that? Seconded Councillor Brand. Um, uh, now, note, I note that there's a, um, an alt rec. Can I ask what the change is? There's no alt rec. No, it's just red. It's just red, which is indicative. It's um, red it's urgent. It's red because it's urgent. Um, are there any speakers on this? Point of order. This is just Mayor. I'm just wondering if we need to read it out for anyone listening, or whether you're just happy to. to 
Let's go with their flow. It's a very long one to read out. It's a, I think uh, I'm taking an, um, Mr. CEO's... Sorry, she's saying read it out. Oh, he's turned on a, it turned in a trice, so I can, I can get your best reading voice on. Um, am I allowed to read an abbreviated version? No. So that, and the motion is that Council submits the following motion to the Australian Local Government Association National General Assembly in June 2019 and that the National Generally, General Assembly calls on federal political parties, including the Liberal Commonwealth Government, to commit to increased funding and action to address the growing problem of homelessness, homelessness in Australia by developing a national plan to reduce homelessness, which places the provision of affordable and social housing at the centre of the plan to reduce homelessness, is informed by housing first principles of providing stable housing and quality and personalised support includes the expansion of evidence-based models which have demonstrated success in ending homelessness, including youth foyers and common ground, establishes specific targets and strategies to reduce homelessness among Indigenous Australians who currently comprise 20% of Australians experiencing homelessness, includes sub-strategies for people rough sleeping, women and children escaping family violence, older people, particularly older women, young people exiting care and juvenile justice, people exiting corrections and those with multiple and complex needs. Do I need to keep, yes. Develop, and then the second part, developing a national housing plan, which one makes affordable and social housing a priority with a long-term national housing plan with associated ministerial portfolio to drive integrated reform across government at all levels of government and across industry sectors. Two, delivering housing-related taxation instruments and other incentives that will increase the supply of affordable housing by attracting institutional and private investment with models like an enhanced build-to-rent scheme that will create affordable private rental housing. Three, address the funding gap between the costs and rental income for low-income households with subsidised rental, for example, longer-term NRAS-type models, or NRAS, uh, accessible to affordable finance, etc. And four, and finally, direct government investment to grow the supply of community housing and build the capacity of the community housing sector, example, a nation-building program. Beautifully read. Um, you should be an actor. Um, Councillor Simich wishes to speak or change or question? Okay. Uh, I'm just wondering how the um, national plan to reduce homelessness, those points, and the housing plan, how those were developed and how they're in line with our In Our Backyard strategy. <laughs> I think you might have to take that on notice. Uh, I'd say they're very well aligned um, because our homeless, well, we're currently revising uh, both so that they are better aligned. But um, in summary, evidence is that, particularly in relation to rough sleepers, housing first approaches are the best. You can't implement housing first approaches without housing. A social worker does not a house make. Um, so I think they're well aligned. I mean, this policy environment would certainly assist the achievement of both strategies. It's Thanks very much. Any further questions? Sorry, it's been moved. Did I get a seconder? I don't think I... Oh, Councillor Brand, the anonymous one. The invisible one. <laughs> Immortal, invisible, brand only wise. Um, Okay, do you wish to speak to it? Just that, you know, providing housing, and it's beyond, you know, the capacity of Just Council to deliver. Um, the providing housing will provide so many more benefits that are probably, well, there's, you know, we can do cost-benefit ratios and there's the economic side, but beyond that, the actual social cohesion and the greater, the greater good that will come from actually investing properly in housing. And it's not our money. Thanks very much. Any further speakers? All those in favour? I declare that against. I declare that carried. Um, urgent business item two, status resolution 
support services. Do I have a mover for that? Move Councillor Copsey. Second, uh, Councillor uh, Simich. Could you please read it out, Councillor Copsey? It's only a shorty, a bit like me. So the motion itself is that Council submits the following motion to the Australian Local Government Association National, <laughs> Association National General Assembly, June 2019. The NGA calls on the Commonwealth Government to reverse its cuts to and fully fund the Status Resolution Support Services SRSS program. So it's been moved and seconded. Um, questions or speeches? This is in line with Council's um, existing support for the um, Back Your Neighbour campaign, which has been run by a number of councils to reverse cuts to the SRSS um, service, uh, which has had a really terrible impact on um, people who have recently arrived in Australia and left many people at risk of homelessness and um, in, in dire straits. Uh, so I, I would urge councillors to support this so that our existing council position can be um, ventilated at the, at the conference and hopefully raise in, um, awareness and, and garner further support for this very important campaign amongst other local governments. Thanks Australia. very much, Councillor Copsey. Councillor Simich. Um, Can <laughs> Councillor Pearl. I'll urge you to vote against it on the basis that um, there's lots of things the federal government do to upset our residents and disadvantage our residents from childcare to uh, taxation to maternity leave to health education, um, but uh, we need to stay focused on local government issues. The reason I voted for the previous one is I think build to rent is the future for social housing in our area, particularly in Fishman's Bend, so albeit that was a extraordinarily long point of order. <coughs> now, could you uh, talk, Councillor Simic, please don't talk when I'm speaking. Sorry. Thank you, bit of respect. Um, was very long and convoluted, but uh, I support Build to Rent wholeheartedly, but this motion um, doesn't uh, focus something uh, in an area that's in our wheelhouse, and for the next couple of motions also, we're better off submitting uh, one that directly relates to the majority of residents in Port Phillip, uh, rather than what uh, sits in the wheelhouse of the federal government. Thanks so much. Thanks, Councillor Pearl. Any further speakers? I move to the vote. All those in favour? Sorry? You want to close? Sorry. Sorry. Just in response to that, um, local government is the level that unfortunately gets um, often left filling the gap when these services are gone. We see the results uh, very regularly in terms of increased risk of homelessness and um, the previous... Uh, uh, Previous motion highlighted the growing need in the city of Port Phillip, so it's absolutely within our um, rights as a local government to advocate on this issue when we're seeing uh, the bite that um, cruel cuts to these services have locally. And uh, quite apart from advocacy, it will result in further people being at risk and in need um, and in need of council services and support if we don't see um, the funding of this essential service restored. So we should vote for it. I'll move to the vote now. All those in favour? That's clearly carried. Oh, against? Clearly carried. Thanks very much. Um, urgent business item three, Adani Mine. Councillor Simich, moving. Uh, seconded, Councillor Baxter. Councillor Simich, do you wish to talk? Uh, again, uh, Mr Mayor, I submit that this is in line with existing council policy. Oh, sorry, I have to ask you to read it out, Councillor Simic. Yes, indeed, apologise. No, um, it's my fault. So the motion reads that council submits the following motion to the Australian Local Government Association National General Assembly, June 2019, that the National General Assembly oppose the Adani mine in the Carmichael Basin of central Queensland. Can I ask you now to speak to it? Thank you, Mayor. Um, as I was saying earlier, um, this is in line with existing council policy. We've talked uh, at length uh, about this specific issue uh, at previous council meetings, um, so I don't wish to reiterate the arguments, but urge all councillors to continue their support uh, and uh, their opposition uh, to the Adani mine, which will cause 
uh, untold harm uh, to uh, our environment, the Great Barrier Reef, um, future generations. It's upon us uh, and our imperative to, to oppose this project. Thanks very much, Councillor Simic. Councillor Baxter. Any other councillor wishes to speak? Move to the vote. All those in favour? Um, all those against? Division Declare required. So, sorry? Division required. All those in favour? Councillor um, Copsey, Simic, Brand, Gross, Voss, Baxter. All those against? Councillor... Um, Bond. Pearl. Pearl. Crawford. Crawford. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, de uh, Council, I declare it carried. Um, urgent business item four, national waste policy. <coughs> Do we have a mover for that? Um, oh, Councillor Baxter. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Copsey. Councillor Baxter, could I ask you to read it into the record for us? Sure. Do you want to make a change, Councillor Copsey? I might let Councillor Baxter go here. That's, you've seconded that. Sorry, we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Councillor Baxter. Um, okay, so the, the motion states that Council submits the following motion to the Australian Local Government Association National General Assembly, June 2019, that the National General Assembly calls on the Commonwealth Government to fast track the development and delivery of the National Waste Policy 2018 Implementation Plan, and for this plan to be fully funded from the Federal Climate Solutions Fund, brackets, formerly the Emissions Reduction Fund, close brackets. Um, now, I believe... Uh, sorry, can I speak to it now? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, now, I, I believe... Um, so, I'm uh, supportive of this motion, but I believe that the um, possible amendment that Councillor Copsey was looking at um, was to perhaps not necessarily limit the funding to the Federal Climate Solutions Fund, that we simply say that it should be fully funded. So, if anyone wants to move an amendment to that, I think I would be uh, amenable to that because I forgot about amending that before I moved the motion. That's my bad. Does anyone want to amend that that isn't a mover or seconder of the motion? Um, Councillor Voss? Uh, the second. Oh. So, was that, are you, sorry, Councillor Copsey? Yes, I'll also admit to that mistake. <laughs> so, just foreshadowing that should anyone wish to move an amendment. What um, amendment would that be? It would be the deletion of that of the final line and a half that's on the screen there, so that it ends at and for this plan to be fully funded and does not specify... Yeah. <laughs> move and second. I'll leave it as that. I think it's minor enough for the move, for the, for the move and second to oh. agree to change it. That's great advice. Are you happy to... Um, uh, uh, do what Councillor Copsey suggested, which was to remove the last part. Yep. So um, yes, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So that it, uh, full stop after fully funded. So that it would end at the words fully funded. Second is, that, second is happy with that. Is the seconder happy with that? Talk to that? Oh well, they've sort of talked to it already. Um, any other councillors wish to speak to it? Thanks for that advice. That's really convenient. Okay. No speakers. Move to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. And finally, urgent business item five, strengthen Telecommunications Act. Move Councillor Voss. Councillor Voss, could, seconded Councillor Baxter. Could I ask... Don't I have to read it first? I'll yeah, could I ask you to read it in? Um, that Council submits the following motion to the Australian Local Government Association National General Assembly, June 2019. That the National General Assembly, the NGA, calls on the Commonwealth Government, government to amend the Telecommunications Act 1997 to improve the existing standards for the delivery of so-called low-impact facilities by introducing guidelines or other regulation that requires enhanced consultation with the community and other stakeholders and consideration of community amenity in the design and placement of the facilities. Do you wish to speak to this, uh, Councillor Voss? 
uh, briefly. I uh, think that the supporting information is very well articulated, but um, I have been noticing an unbelievable proliferation of low impact facilities um, such as roadside cabinets. They're just popping up every day. I see a new one just installed. Dishes, antennae, cable pits and public pay phones. So they're not regulated because of their size. Um, so maybe one's not a impact, but when you have a collection of them all, and many of them are actually in the same place, being the, the cabinets and then um, the 5G um, uh, uh, materials and things like that, it, it does add up and it is, um, I think, a blight on our, on our, um, our right, public okay. space. Councillor Baxter? I won't add a, a whole lot more except to say that these supposed low impact facilities can often have a quite high impact on people with disabilities or people with limited mobility in terms of the way that they clutter up the urban landscape. Um, they're, the, these things are often or really don't seem to be taken into account with the existing regulations, so I'd really like to see some tightening up. Does anyone else wish to add? I'll move to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Well, thanks very much. Councillors, we have no confidential items tonight. There being no further business, I declare the meeting closed. Well done, everyone. Thanks very much.